I think the first thing to understand, to really understand black literature and perhaps to appreciate this novel, uh, The Book of Negroes, is to know that the first form of literature written and published worldwide by black writers is the autobiography, the slave narrative. There are hundreds of slave narratives, slave autobiographies written by men and women who uh, learned how to write even though it was illegal to do so as a slave and to prove their humanity, to assert their freedom. Once they became free, they wrote their memoirs, they wrote their stories, and this is the first form of literature widely published by black writers. Some of these autobiographies are world famous, uh, such as the one by Olato Equiano, or the one by Frederick Douglass, or Mary Prince. There are some famous autobiographies by women writers too. Uh, some of them, therefore, are world famous and hundreds of pages long. Others just are just one or two or three paragraphs long and very obscure. But I guess I've read hundreds of them over the years. And I wrote the Book of Negroes as a as a novel that pretends to be an autobiography that's written in the voice of an 18th century African woman, and it's written as if it were an autobiography. This is my life, dear reader, and I'm going to tell you my life, dear reader, to assert my equality to you, to show you that I'm equal to you, and to make sense of my life. And I guess. Uh, two of the most overriding principles in the experience of, of black people in the Americas was one, of course, to obtain freedom, but the other was to obtain the gift of literacy and to prove one's equality by writing down one's story to com by communicating orally or on paper one's history. And so I wrote this uh, to really stand on the shoulders of the African American and African Canadian literary tradition, which is the slave narrative. So my protagonist, Aminata Diallo, is an 18th century African woman who tells her story of being born in Africa in the country we now know as Mali, in, in a, a landlocked country in West Africa where I've worked as a volunteer. Um, and she comes to North America as a slave, as a young girl, um, and I'll tell you a little bit about her movements around the world, which represent the movements of the black loyalists. And the story really at attempts to depict the journeys of the black loyalists by concentrating on the life of this 18th century African woman, Aminata Diallo. Um, I think maybe the easiest way to depict that history and to engage your imagination is to tell you a little bit about black history in Canada, because um, although Many people know about the story of slavery and segregation and freedom and desegregation in the United States. Uh, very few people know about the history of blacks in Canada. And slavery, uh, basically, people of African origin have lived in Canada for just as long as they have in the United States. The first documented black person in Canada was around 1603, 1604. He was um, originally from Portugal. Uh, he came to help a French-Canadian explorer, and he was a translator between this French-Canadian explorer and uh, Aboriginal peoples in Canada. His name was Matthew de Costa. He was a free black man. That was around 1603, 1605. The first documented slave in Canada is a young boy living in Quebec City uh, in the French part of Canada. His name was Olivier Lejeune, and he's eight years old when we find him in the records, and he's a slave of a Catholic priest in Quebec City in 1628. So that's the first documented slave in Canada, 1628, Quebec City. Um, and whereas in the United States, uh, the climate was such that there were massive agricultural plantations. In Canada, since we didn't have a climate that permitted agricultural plantations of cotton or, or sugar uh, um, or similar products such as indigo, uh, slavery was primarily a, an urban phenomenon in Canada. Slavery was primarily a phenomenon that took place in our cities rather than in, in uh, agricultural plantations. And the first large movement of black people into Canada took place in 1783 when 3,000 black people fled New York City and came to Canada. Uh, 3,000 coming to very small areas in rural Atlantic Canada in the province of Nova Scotia on the Atlantic coast. Why did they come? What does this story have to do with Europe and Africa 
and the United States. And to explain that story, I guess I need to tell you about, about the, the black loyalists. So if you can imagine this journey, uh, first of all, my character, Aminata, is born as a child in Mali in West Africa. She's abducted as a slave uh, and brought over into the Americas, as millions of others were. And she brought, she's brought to South Carolina. South Carolina, when she's about 10 years old, around 1755 or so, is still a British province. It's still a British territory. So the state of South Carolina on the Atlantic coast of what is now the United States. And she's, she works as a slave in an indigo plantation, a plantation where the product indigo is grown, which yields a dye, which, which is similar to the color that we see in blue jeans. So they're a very popular dye in England at the time. So the indigo crop is a very important cash crop in South Carolina in the middle of the 18th century. So she works as a slave in this indigo plantation. And then she's sold to another slave owner who's Jewish who works in a city in Charleston, South Carolina. So she goes to work for him, learns to read and write, which he allows her to do. And then she comes up to New York City during the American Revolutionary War, the war in which the British colonies fight for their freedom from, from England and go on to create the United States of America. And during this war, this revolutionary war, the British try to suppress the revolution, try to kill the rebels who are seeking their independence from England by promising freedom to any black people who will serve them and fight for them and help them during the war. So thousands of black people free, flee slavery, run from their condition of slavery in the United States and come to New York City to serve the British during the seven or eight year American Revolution. They're in New York City, they've come for their freedom, and they need to prove their usefulness to the British by serving the British in every manner possible. And the British promise in writing freedom to any black person who come to serve them during the war. So men and women with their children come to New York City, 1775, 1776, thousands come to the lower end of New York City, um, the only part of the city that was urban. The rest of Manhattan was still a forest. And uh, they come to help the British. They are soldiers, they're spies, they're cooks, they build roads, they're prostitutes, they're midwives. They do anything they can possibly do to prove their usefulness to the British. The British are very happy to liberate the slaves of their American enemies, but they keep their own slaves, thank you very much. The British do not liberate their own slaves, they keep them in slavery. They liberate the slaves of their enemies, the American rebels. And so Aminata, my protagonist, comes up to New York City to gain her freedom and to serve the British during the war. And at the end of the war, well, the British have promised freedom to the black people who've served them, but the British lost the war. So how are they to offer freedom to the thousands of people who risked their lives to serve the British? Since the British lost the war, they're not in a position to offer freedom to anybody in the United States. So they flee and they take the blacks with them. And they, a few of them go to Germany, one or two go to Jamaica or Barbados, a handful go to Quebec City, but almost the entire number of the 3,000 black loyalists who are fleeing New York City go to Nova Scotia, Canada, mostly free, some as slaves of the British. And there they've been promised freedom, they've been promised political equality, they've been promised land, they've been promised food to live on until they can grow crops to live on. And although they are given their freedom in some respects, others are kept in slavery in Canada, and they're not given food to live with, and they're not given land on which they can grow crops, and they're not given home, so many are freezing and starving to death in the Canadian winters, or digging holes in the ground and covering themselves with trees in holes in the ground to survive the Canadian winters. And they're so disappointed by this betrayal in Canada um, that 10 years later, they leave. And with the sanction of the British Navy and the British Parliament, and with the support of British abolitionists, those who are seeking to abolish slavery and the slave trade, they sail again from, this time from Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada in 1792 and they travel across the Atlantic Ocean to create the colony of Freetown in Sierra Leone in West Africa.
What's striking about this journey is that it represents the first time in the history of the world that thousands of black people are leaving the Americas and going to Africa. And they're not just going to Africa, but they're going back. Because many of these people have been born in Africa, stolen from Africa, sold into slavery in places like South Carolina, Virginia, North Carolina, have come up to New York City during the war, have traveled to Nova Scotia after the war, and then they go back to Africa before they die to insist on their freedom, which they never received in Canada or in North America. So it's a staggering journey, one that I'd never heard of before. I'd never heard that these, uh, say 1,200 black men, women, and children had been able to leave Canada and return to the continent from which they were stolen, the continent in which they were born. It's a story that, uh, although I've been studying black history all my life, it's a story I'd never heard before, which I chose to dramatize in this novel, The Book of Negroes. So I wrote it entirely in the voice of a woman who tells her life story as if it were an autobiography. And I'm going to read you just one or two very brief excerpts to give you the sound that I was looking for in trying to create this person who is Aminata, Aminata Diallo. And Aminata, for those of you who may have traveled in West Africa, is a very common Muslim name. It's as common as Mary or Joanne in, in Canada or the United States. And so Aminata is the name of my protagonist. And I'm going to read you just a page or two from the opening chapter to give you a sense of her voice as an old woman. She's gone to London, England to fight for the abolition of the British slave trade. In Canada and in the British Empire, slavery was abolished in 1834. That's about 31 years before it was abolished in the United States. But before slavery itself could be abolished, the slave trade had to be abolished. And the slave trade refers to the selling of human beings from Africa into markets in the Americas. So the slave trade was abolished before slavery itself. And so Aminata has gone to London as an old woman, just a step from the grave to fight for the abolition of the slave trade. And this is near the end of her life. It's just a little bit before 1807, which is when the British Parliament finally voted to abolish the slave trade. So we, here we are in London around 1802, 1805, and Aminata is talking to the reader. The other day, they took me into a London school and had me talk to the children. One girl asked if it was true that I was the famous Mina D, the one mentioned in all the newspapers. Her parents, she said, did not believe that I could have lived in so many places. I acknowledged that I was Mina D, but that she could call me Aminata Diallo if she wanted, which was my childhood name. We worked on my first name for a while. After three tries, she got it. Aminata, four syllables. It's really not that hard, Aminata. I told her. She said she wished I could meet her parents and her grandparents. I replied that it amazed me that she still had grandparents in her life. Love them good, I told her, and love them big. Love them every day. She asked why I was so black. I asked why she was so white. She said she was born that way. Same here, I replied. I can see that you must have been quite pretty, even though you are so very dark, she said. You would be prettier if London ever got any sun, I replied. <laughs> she asked what I ate. My grandfather says he bets you eat raw elephant. I told her I'd never actually taken a bite out of an elephant. But there had been times in my life when I was hungry enough to try. I chased three or four hundred of them in my life, but never managed to get one to stop rampaging through villages and stand still long enough for me to take a good bite. She laughed and said she wanted to know what I really ate. I eat what you eat, I told her. Do you suppose I'm going to find an elephant walking about the streets of London? Sausages, eggs, mutton stew, bread, crocodiles, all those regular things. <laughs> crocodiles, she said. I told her I was just checking to see if she was listening. She said she was an excellent listener and wanted me to please tell her a ghost story. Honey, I said, my life is a ghost story. Then tell it to me, she said. As I told her, I am Aminata Diallo, daughter of Mamadou Diallo and Sira Koulibaly, born in the village of Bayo, three moons by foot from the Grain Coast in West Africa. <laughs> 
I'm a Bamana and a Fula. I'm both, and we'll explain that later. I suspect I was born in 1745 or close to it, and I'm writing this account, all of it. Should I perish before the task is done, I've instructed John Clarkson, one of the quieter abolitionists, but the only one I trust to change nothing. So that's a little beginning, a little taste of the sound of Aminata as an old woman. As a novelist, as an artist, the hardest part for me in the novel was to create a voice of an old woman, a voice that to me sounded authentic, to me that sounded believable, that to me hopefully the reader would, would buy, would take, would, would accept. It was, so I had to go over and over and over again working on that, uh, on that voice until I was, um, was satisfied with the voice of Aminata as an old woman looking back on her life. Once that was um, satisfactory, I felt the rest of the novel was easier to write. I'm just gonna read you one other very brief excerpt of just half a page or so. And um, one of the things I was meditating on was what would be Aminata's state of mind as an 11 or 12 year old girl, barely pubescent, just entering puberty, arriving without any clothes on the shores of America in 1757. What would be in her mind? What would she think? How would she feel in those first hours in America? So she lands on an island off the coast of South Carolina. The island is called Sullivan's Island, and it was a quarantine station. It was a place where slaves were held in quarantine until they could be determined to be free of disease, and then they'd be sold into slave markets. So she's in quarantine for a few days on Sullivan's Island off the coast of South Carolina. This is now 1757. She's about 11 or 12. And her word in the book, her word, her, her word in her language for white people is tubabu in the plural, or tubab in the singular. So you may hear me use the word tubabu, which refers to, in her mind, to white people. So this is just a page or so to give you a sense of me imagining her voice as a young child. We were brought to an island just off the coast of the tubabu's land. There were about 100 of us left. We were all placed inside a square barricade. Tubabu stood as sentries at the gate and patrolled inside with clubs and fire sticks. But mostly we were left alone to wonder what would now become of us. It seemed to me that we had traveled to the other side of the sun. On this side of the world, the sun was worn out and not to be trusted. My fingers grew thick and numb every night and throbbed every day as the sun climbed the sky. My ears were cold. My nose was cold. Like the others, I'd been given a rough cloth barely long enough to wrap around my backside. I shivered at night on the sandy earth, and one morning I awoke to find smoke trickling from my mouth. I thought my face had caught fire. I thought that someone had bedeviled me during the night or branded my tongue. I waited for the burning. I prepared to scream. I held my breath. No smoke. I breathed. Smoke again. It came from within me. No burning, just smoke. The smoke in my breath continued until the sun began to climb the sky, and then I noticed that others too had smoke mouths in the morning. So that's Aminata's first perception on Sullivan's Island in 1757. Um, I guess one of the biggest challenges in writing the novel was to imagine the voice of a girl and a woman from Mali in West Africa living in this new state in the new world. It helped a great deal that I've spent, well, several times working as a volunteer in rural villages in West Africa living in villages much like the one in which Aminata was born. It helped me to see and to feel and to stay in these villages when I was a young man and it helped me write those scenes, the scenes of her childhood, particularly in Mali. But I think what I'll do now is move over and show you a few of the pieces of information I discovered in libraries and, and bookstores that helped me imagine how this story would, would be written and what her, her life might look like. Perhaps we can go to the first slide Anna. So that's the cover of the book. I just explained, uh, if we can go back, if you don't mind, one slide, Anna, to the very first one. Yeah. I should tell you, the Book of Negroes, uh, 
is not just the title of the novel, but it's the name of a British document. Negroes is a fairly controversial word in the year 2017, and I would never use the word Negroes in ordinary speech in English today. It's, an, it's a word that was used with respect in black cultures, which I'm from in Canada, in the United States, right up to the early 1980s. But language has changed a lot, and it's no longer a word that's in fashion, or a word that should be used in polite company but I wasn't using it to be provocative or to insult anybody. I was using it to resurrect or to have my readers remember a forgotten document. And this document was called the Book of Negroes. It was kept by the British Navy to record the exodus, the departure of 3,000 black Americans from New York City to Nova Scotia. And if you were an African American and if you served the British during the American Revolutionary War, you were not allowed to leave New York City and sail to Nova Scotia until your name was entered into the Book of Negroes. It's the first time that thousands of black people are publicly documented in North America. Their name, their age, their marital status, if they have children, what they look like, who used to own them as a slave owner, what ship they're going on, where they're sailing to, and what they did during the American Revolutionary War. All of these bits of information are recorded in this British military ledger kept by the British Navy to record the, the names and details of the black people who are leaving New York to come to Canada. Why? Why would this ledger be kept? Because the British were fearful that the Americans would be angry that they were departing with American property. The black people who were leaving New York City were considered to be American property. So the British kept this ledger because they knew that later on they might have to compensate financially the Americans for taking their property, so to speak, these black people taking them from New York City to Canada. So they kept the Book of Negroes as proof of what they were taking in case later they were required to pay for what they had done. Um, so that's the name of this document, which I've seen in the National Archives of the United Kingdom and in various libraries in the United States and Canada and archives. So I've seen, and you could find it online in about 10 seconds. If you looked up the Book of Negroes, you could find the original document online, which is a fascinating document. It's about 150 pages long. It has 3,000 names in it. And again, it's the first massive piece of genealogical information about black people in America and Canada and Africa and the in Europe, so it, it unites black history on both sides of the Atlantic. That's the story of the Book of Negroes. And if we could just go on now to the next slide, uh, this is uh, sort of a, a sm small houses that you would see in Mali, where Aminata was born and where I lived as well uh, as a young man working as a volunteer. Perhaps we could just move on to the next slide. One of the biggest challenges I faced in researching the novel was to come to understand something that I'd never read about before. And even though I had read much about slavery in Canada and the United States, one thing I did not understand before writing this book was how exactly were African people taken from Africa and sold into ships and taken to the Americas. How did they get onto these ships? Where were they taken from? And how were they moved across land to the, to the water where they were sold into slavery? This was something I did not understand and did not know how it worked. And not much has been written about the movement of, of Africans across Africa to the coast where they were sold into slavery. Finally, I came across this fascinating diary, this personal journal kept by this Scottish doctor whose name was Mungo Park. So he was a physician, a doctor from Scotland, and in around 1795 to 1797, Mungo Park became one of the very first Europeans ever to travel deep into the heart of Africa. Until Mungo Park traveled in the late 18th century deep into West Africa, Europeans had been confined to ports on the coast of Africa. They did not know what the interior of Africa looked like. They had not been there. They, they confined themselves to the coast where they paid Africans to bring them human property. So Mungo Park traveled deep into West Africa and he kept a diary and he discovered entire walking villages of people who were attached by the neck and who were being brought as slaves attached by the neck from their villages to the coast. Some of those people had been walking for three months or as I said in the novel, three revolutions of the moon because Aminata marks time by her own menstrual cycles and by the revolutions of the moon. That's how she marks 
time. And so Aminata walks like this, except she has no clothes. And this painting is somewhat romantic. This, is, this painting is much prettier than the reality because the people who've been captured here are wearing clothes, whereas for the most part they did not have clothes when they were captured. So this diary by this Scottish physician gave me my first insight into the movement of African peoples overland, sometimes for 1,000 kilometers, walking for three months until they were finally arriving at the coast where they'd be sold into slave ships. Perhaps we could move to the next slide. So um, this is a, oh, I'll just skip. Sorry, that was a, th that's a, that's a painting by, uh, I'm sorry, that's out of order from what I've got, which is my own fault, but I'll just tell you what it is anyway. This is a British artist whose name is J.M.W. Turner. He was a very famous British painter. And uh, this work of art, it's a little hard to see from where you're sitting, but you might discern or see that there are hands reaching out of the water, black hands reaching out of the water in this ocean. And there's a ship on the left-hand side that looks like it's about to capsize or is in great danger. And it's an image of, of a ship that is throwing slaves overboard to capture or to, to cash in on insurance money. And there was a very famous case in which uh, a British slave vessel called the Zong was sailing in 1781 from Africa to Jamaica. And in order to profit from insurance payments, they threw more than 100 African people into the ocean live in order to cash in on insurance payments. So some of these hideous mistreatments of African people in slave vessels were depicted in this painting by this very famous British painter, J.M.W. Turner. So um, the painting is entitled, Slavers Throwing Overboard the Dead and the Dying. And uh, it, it, it just gave me the idea of uh, some of the horrors of the Middle Passage, the movement of African peoples across the Atlantic Ocean into uh, slavery. Perhaps we could go to the next one. Oh, so this is a fairly famous black, contemporary black artist in the United States whose name is Jonathan Green. He lives in Florida, but he's from South Carolina, and he comes from the Gullah culture. The Gullah peoples are the peoples of various African origins who came to settle during the time of slavery in the 18th century in the islands just off the coast of South Carolina. And his paintings, as you can see, are very vivid and colorful, and they celebrate sort of community life. And uh, the, I particularly like the one on the left, which um, gives you a sense of, uh, of the idea of people sitting around it, conversing and sharing in culture and in storytelling. And it sort of helped me to remember that we're not just talking about faceless people here. The slaves, the people I'm trying to depict in the novel, they have community, they have lovers, they have work, they have children, they have stories to tell each other. They are much more than slaves. They are human beings with their own communities. And so this painting, I think, attempts to, attempts to signify the sense of community that such people might have had. Perhaps we can move forward. This is uh, actually not representing South Carolina, but this is coming from the Caribbean. But this is a, a painting showing the indigo trade, the indigo plantations. And indigo, again, was a cash crop. It was the most important cash crop grown in the third quarter of the 18th century in the islands off the coast of South Carolina. Indigo, again, is a plant that grows to about the height of a corn stalk, and there's a fine um, there's a fine dust on each leaf, and you soak the leaves in various tanks of water and, and chemical products, and from that, those plants you extract a dye, which generates the color purple, blues, the indigo color. And um, it's a very dangerous form of work because uh, although this painting does not represent it, in South Carolina, the indigo is grown in swampy marshlands, and of course, malaria is very present in these swampy marshlands. So many people are dying of malaria. In fact, it's so dangerous to work in these indigo plantations that the white owners of these plantations, they leave during what is called the sick season, the season, the season when people might get sick from malaria. We don't yet know in the 1700s that the mosquito is a vector of malaria. But we do know that people get sick in the spring, summer, and fall. And so the white owners of these plantations leave their plantations, and the plantations are entirely run by black slaves. Entirely. 
And what that means is that uh, a certain slave culture known as a, and language known as a Gullah culture, that's G-U-L-L-A-H, the Gullah culture and language proliferates in this part of North America because uh, slaves are living for extended parts of each year, six months of each year alone without white control. And it's the only instance in the entire United States where a new language, a new black language emerges during slavery. And this language, again, is called Gullah. And you can still hear it if you travel to the islands off the coast of South Carolina. Could we go to the next one? Oh, that's just a drawings of various stages of the indigo production. I think I'll skip over that one. OK, so this is the final result of all that work with indigo. This is the color that was so much wanted for clothing in, in England and elsewhere. So that's a, a woman wearing a dress with the indigo dye. And we'll go along. So one of the things that I was thinking about to imagine that life that Aminata might have on this indigo plantation was to imagine illness and, and dealing with illness. And smallpox is a major illness at this time in the United States. And indeed, during the American Revolution, more soldiers died from smallpox than died from military wounds. Many more people died of smallpox soldiers than died of, of war wounds. And so this is a, a drawing of somebody who's recovering from uh, smallpox. And in the novel, Aminata is inoculated by a woman who takes care of her as if she were her mother and is given an inoculation, basically some clothes from a man who'd been sick with smallpox. These clothes are taken and they're stitched into her skin to expose her to, to the illness. And it's, uh, and it's indeed a fact that, that people of Aboriginal background, indigenous Americans and black Americans from the 18th century were, were experimenting with their own inoculations to, to um, prepare themselves for smallpox so they wouldn't die when these epidemics swept through the countrysides. So uh, uh, help me with the scene. This is maybe one of the most interesting parts of the novel in the research to me. I spent a lot of time looking at maps of Africa from the 16th and 17th and 18th centuries. And uh, as you'll see, and as I came to discover, maps, European maps of Africa were were exercises in art. You see all these drawings of cities on the corner of the map and drawings of people on the sides. But uh, the thing about uh, European maps of Africa is that Europeans didn't know what Africa looked like. They hadn't penetrated deep into Africa. They'd limited to the coast. And so when they didn't know what something really looked like, when they had no idea what might be in the middle of Africa, they just put an elephant. But why not put an elephant? Because they don't know what, what else to put there. So sometimes you see these sort of preposterous European imaginations of what Africa might be, such as the elephant in West Africa you see there, sort of smack dab in the middle of the map. And as I watched these, looked at these maps and studied them when I was researching the novel, I started to imagine my character, Aminata, discovering these maps. And I started to imagine what her reaction might be. Might she be insulted as she's looking at these maps to see her continent depicted in this way? She wants to go home. She wants to find her way home. That's her one overriding objective throughout her life. I want to go home because she's been kidnapped or stolen when she was a young girl. She always wants to go back. But she doesn't know how to go back. So she starts looking at maps once she's become literate and once she knows about numeracy. She starts looking at maps at every opportunity. She asks to see maps, but the maps that she finds do not represent the place that she came from. And so as a novelist, I wondered, would it be appropriate for her to feel a measure of anger and frustration, or would that be imposing my own 21st century mentality on an 18th century African woman? Was it right or was it wrong for me to indicate that she would feel a level of anger and frustration at seeing how her continent is depicted? Finally, and my character is born around 1745, and finally, while I was researching these maps, I came across this poem by the British novelist and poet, sorry, the Scottish novelist and poet, um, Jonathan Swift. And uh, Jonathan Swift wrote about these maps when he was, um, when he, he was writing a, a, a long poem in the year 1733. So this poet writes about these maps in 1733, which was about 10 or 12 years before my character is born. And what he writes in this poem, 
is the following line, which you'll see in the, in the introductory pages to the novel. He writes, um, so, so geographers in Afric maps with savage pictures fill their gaps and o'er uninhabitable downs place elephants for want of towns. So in this poem that he writes, he's mocking, he's satirizing the idiocy of these maps. And so I thought that if Jonathan Swift could write with anger about these maps in 1733, my character, who was born 10 or 12 years later, could also feel I felt a measure of anger and frustration at these maps. So I let her have her anger in the novel. Perhaps we could go to the next one. This is for Sam Francis in the Francis Tavern. Sam Francis was a man who owned this prosperous tavern in the southern tip of New York City during the war. When George Washington won the American Revolution, he came to celebrate with his generals in Francis's tavern. And then when George Washington became the first president of the United States, he hired Sam Francis to work for him as his chief cook. What makes Sam Francis an interesting person, and why did I put him in the novel? And by the way, he's played in the miniseries by a famous African-American um, actor whose name is Cuba Gooding Jr. But at any rate, Sam Francis, if you're a black historian from the United States and you specialize in 18th century black history, you will declare that Sam Francis is black. But if you're a white historian in the United States writing about Sam Francis, you will say that Sam Francis was white. There is a fight about the racial identity of Sam Francis. And because he's an important person, he owned this tavern, he was Washington's first cook, uh, people want him to belong to them. And uh, so I chose to decide that he was black for the purposes of this novel. And indeed, his ancestors have written to me, people who are alive today, who tell me his living and his living descendants, I should say, that he was indeed black and that they descend from a black man. But there's a terrific fight among academics and others about the racial origins of Sam Francis. He came from uh, the Caribbean. Uh, I believe he was of mixed race. In one of the American censuses in the early, uh, around the 1750s, He's shown as white in the American census, which is proof that the white American historians use this claim that he's white, but everybody knows that errors were made all the time in the census in the United States in this time and place. And so the fact that somebody is described as white in a census does not mean that he's truly white. It just means that the census taker might have been wrong. And so there are many other indications that he was black or at least of mixed race. And so in the novel, I chose to make him black and he owns this tavern and he becomes involved with Aminata as she comes in New York City. So that's, and you can visit, if you go to New York City, go visit the Francis Tavern, it's a museum. Um, but they'll tell you he's white. But think about it when you, and read about it, and you'll see that there's quite a debate about his, his origin. Perhaps we can go to the next slide. So this is, you've probably heard of Wall Street in New York City, um, and you've heard of the Wall Street Journal. Well, this is a wall. Basically, this is a wall separating urban New York from the forest of Manhattan. And black people were not allowed to bury their dead in the city or in the churches of the city. They had to go north of the wall in order to bury their dead north of the wall. So this is a, a painting that depicts Wall Street and black communities uh, north of the wall where they would be allowed to do things such as bury their dead. Oh, so this is a proclamation from Lord Dunmore, the um, governor of Virginia. And Lord Dunmore is the governor of Virginia. He, he's British, and he's a slave owner, uh, but he's offering freedom to any African-American slaves who run away from their uh, state of slavery and serve the British during the war. So this is one of two written formal proclamations from the British promising freedom to any African American who runs from slavery to help the British during the war. Again, a fascinating hypocrisy. He's a slave owner himself, but he's promising freedom to any African American slave who fights with the British during the war. So that's his proclamation. And this is a page from the Book of Negroes, the actual document. Uh, for each person, there are two pages of information. This is just one page. And there are up to nine columns of information in the Book of Negroes for each person. As I was mentioning, age, marital status, uh, what they looked like, 
who used to own them, how they came to be free, what they did during the war, where they're sailing to, what the name of their ship is, all these things. So it's a very interesting document, a little bit hard to decipher, to understand at first, but you, you come to understand it when you spend some time with it. And I went to England um, when I uh, won a prize, and the Queen had me spend 15 minutes with her in Buckingham Palace, um, talking, and all she wanted to talk about while we sat for 15 minutes was the Book of Negroes. And she said, I haven't read your book, but I'd like to know about this Book of Negroes. And I found it very interesting that as a Canadian, I was telling the Queen something about British history because she didn't know about this document, which was kept by the British Navy. So it gave me a chance to tell the Queen something about the history of her own country. That's the Book of Negroes. Many Canadians, unfortunately, do not know or deny that slavery existed in Canada. They like to point to slavery in the United States because it's morally comfortable to point to the problems of another country. But this is an advertisement in a newspaper in Halifax, Canada, advertising for the sale of a slave in Canada. So I like to show this to Canadians, especially to Canadian students, so they can see visual evidence of the existence of slavery in Canada too. It's always convenient to point to the moral defects of another country. So part of my work as a novelist is to remind Canadians of their own history in their own land, some of which is, is very negative. This is Rose Fortune, a very uh, well-known woman in, in African-Canadian history. She was living in the 18th century. She was a self-appointed police officer on the docks, arresting people who were drunk on the, on the docks uh, near the shore in Halifax. And also she helped unload ships, so she unload do documents and boxes off ships and into hotels and the like. So Rose Fortune is one of the first, first famous black women of early Canada. So that's a painting of her. I saw this painting of a man in Nova Scotia around the time my novel is set in Nova Scotia, around uh, 1783 to 1790, that time frame. In this painting from that same time period, it was, it was done by an amateur, but it's very rare to find a painting of a black person in Canada in the 18th century in a domestic, ordinary situation. Sometimes you might see a depiction of a black person as a slave, but it's rare to find a depiction in painting of a black person in Canada doing ordinary things like everybody else does. So this man is sawing a log and he's paid to saw through these logs. And it gave me the idea of a scene in the novel where a man would be sawing logs, being paid to do this, and would be attacked by a mob during a, a race riot in uh, Nova Scotia. So watching, looking at this painting gave me the idea for a scene in, in the section of the novel that takes place in Nova Scotia. Thank you, Anna. This is another very rare painting of a black family in Nova Scotia. Again, I'm just showing it because it's so very rare to find black people shown doing ordinary domestic things in Canada. And so when I can find an ordinary one, it's, it's rich and very special, so I'm sharing it with you there. This is a painting I find quite fascinating. This depicts the arrival of, it shows the arrival of the 1,200 black people from Nova Scotia who sailed in 1792 from Nova Scotia across the Atlantic Ocean to create the colony of Freetown in Sierra Leone and West Africa. They were in 15 ships. We're talking about 1,200 men, women, and children. Again, as I said before, many of these Nova Scotian Canadian black men, women, and children were born in Africa, enslaved in the ways I've described and are finally returning to Africa late in their lives. And it looks, if we could just go back for a minute to that one, it looks idyllic, it looks sort of like paradise, but actually it's deceiving. It's, it's a horrifically disturbing painting if you have a chance to really study it closely because this also is a painting done by an amateur. This is not a professional painter, but Although these ships are supposed to represent the black Canadians coming to Sierra Leone, if you look on the left-hand side of the painting, you'll see some small rowboats that are taking slaves to slave vessels, which are about to leave from the same waters, travel across the ocean, and sell those captives into slavery in Canada and the Americas. So this is a hideous depiction of the intermixture of, of Canadian blacks arriving to be free at the same time that other Africans are being sold into slavery and being taken in these small boats to a slave vessel and about to be departing across the Atlantic Ocean. And indeed, when the Canadians arrived in 
in Freetown and Sierra Leone, created the town of Freetown in Sierra Leone. It turned out that one of the biggest slave factories in all of Africa, a slave factory being a place where African people are kept like a dungeon before they were sold into ships and taken across the ocean. One of the very biggest slave factories in all of Africa was located just 30 kilometers from the very place where the African Canadians arrived. It was on an island called Bunce Island, and these slaves are coming from this slave factory, which is just down the river from where the African Canadians settle in Africa. So it's a very disturbing mixture of freedom and slavery existing in the same spot of this painting. So that's why uh, the painting is significant to me. And I'll just show you one last slide and then move on to some questions. I quite love this slide. It's the British were so great at, at sort of outrageous satire. And this is from a very famous British artist, a caricaturist, who wrote caricatures. His name was James Gilray. This comes from the time of my novel, 1792. And this, this um, caricature satirizes King George III and his wife, Queen Charlotte. Uh, what are they talking about? What are they discussing? These are their children on the right, some of their many children. So the King of England and his wife, King George and Queen Charlotte. Well, as you can imagine, in 1792, the most significant slave trading nation in the world is Great Britain. There is no nation deriving more profit from slavery in the world than is Great Britain in this time. But in this painting, the queen is urging her children to do without sugar in their tea, to take their tea without sugar, to save their father all the troubles of enslaving those poor Africans. Because if they would just take their tea without sugar, their poor papa wouldn't have to deal with so many problems dealing with these poor African people. So they are, this character pretends that the king and queen care about the, about the welfare, about the well-being of black people who are enslaved, which is, of course, preposterous since they are the world leaders of slavery at the time. So it's a very biting and angry satire of the British royal family. And so I liked it very much because it points out the hypocrisy of the British at this time. So up at the top, uh, the word you might find kind of amusing, I don't quite know how you translate that into Spanish, but it's called the anti-saccharites. Of course, that would be a very old-fashioned way of saying those who are against the use of sugar, the anti-saccharites. And John Bull and his family, John Bull is sort of like saying in the United States, Uncle Sam. John Bull is an expression that refers to the royal family in Great Britain at this time. So the anti saccharides John Bull and his family leaving off the use of sugar. So it, uh, I found it tremendously entertaining and very biting and highly political, this uh, caricature, especially when you consider it was done in 1792. So thank you so much for listening. I'm happy to share a few details about the novel and its research, and I'd be more than happy to answer questions. If you have any questions or any comments, please feel free to, to answer. And if any of you have a book uh, afterwards, I'm happy to say hello and to sign it for you if, if you'd like. Thanks so much. Uh, I think that uh, this deserves another round of applause. <laughs> Thank you, Larry. Um, I was thinking as I was looking at this picture, um, and you were talking about the hypocrisy of British people and uh, the British monarchs, etc. Uh, how this woman seems to have rotten teeth, actually, from drinking um, beverages or tea with sugar. So at the same time as they are saying, let's stop the use of sugar, you see how they are using it, right? I mean, yes, it's their very health. true. Yeah, it's a very, uh, it's a very hostile depiction of the queen, isn't it? Right. And by the way, some people thought the queen had black ancestry. Yeah. She was sometimes referred to as, as, uh, as black. Right. And, uh, and there's a debate among historians about whether indeed Queen Charlotte did have black mm -hmm. ancestry. Mm -hmm. But some people feel that she did. OK, so let's uh, open the floor for questions. Um, is anyone daring to open? OK, Lydia. Hang on and I will give you the mic. 
Um, hi, <laughs> that's better. Um, first, um, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I was wondering, you've touched briefly on the issue of misrepresentation and how difficult it is to represent things that we are not particularly in touch with, um, as in, you know, the boys of a woman at that time. And I was wondering, as a scholar of black history and as a writer, if you have any advice for people like us who are students who come from an European colonial background and who might be um, interested in writing about um, issues of race, colonialism, but who might be uh, afraid that they lack the, the sensibility to do so without misrepresenting everything. So if you had any kind of <laughs> words on that. Thank you for your question. As you were asking it, I smiled at my daughter because that's a question that is often asked in Canada too. It's a very important and vital question. But fundamentally, I think that the most important thing is to do honest work that is uh, that acknowledges who you are and doesn't pretend to be something that it's not and that you wouldn't pretend to be a person that you're not that acknowledges your interests your own background your own perspective as you come to the work and that is serious and is academically or creatively as honest and as authentic as possible i think that ultimately and i know this is a, a a contentious issue, and not everybody will agree with me, but ultimately I think a work has to be judged on its own merits, and we can't go saying that you shouldn't be free to write about something and to investigate it or to become a scholar uh, about something simply because you're not a certain person. You're born with a certain baggage, you're born with a certain identity that, that you grow into, you can't really do much about that, but you should feel free to do your work and to do it beautifully, but to do it honestly in Canada, one of the most prominent writers about black history in Canada is a man on whose work I lean very heavily when I was researching not just this book, but the other books I've written. His name is James Walker, and he's white, and he's written the most definitive story of the black loyalists. Sometimes in, in Canada, he's given a hard time, and some people resent you know, his prominence in his scholarship, but others welcome him as he's worked for decades inside black communities, supporting them, advocating with them, being an, an activist inside black communities, although, he, although he's white. And so I feel that whether you're a novelist or a scholar, I feel that uh, you should just proceed honestly and, and do your work and do it to the best of your ability and, and not to be too fearful or to, at least to convert the fear into energy, energy that makes sure that you're doing very good work and talking to the right people and working extra hard to produce authentic work. Uh, ultimately, I feel the work has to be judged not on the basis of who wrote it, but on the basis of, of the work itself. That would be my, my opinion. Thank, Thank you. you for asking. Thank you. Okay, any more questions? I, Hello. Uh, I wanted to ask, why did you uh, choose uh, a woman to be the main character of your book instead of a man? Why did I choose a woman to be the main character of my book instead of a man? Well, I never really thought about writing this book from the perspective of a man. I never considered it. From the minute I learned about this migration I've been telling you about, about the movement of African Canadians back to Africa in 1792, uh, to create the colony of Freetown in Sierra Leone. And I started filling in their movements around the world before they came back to Africa. I started to imagine my character and who that char character might be. And I immediately envisaged and felt a woman, you know, on the page, on the empty page that I was looking at. What did she look like? What was the sound of her voice? How did she walk? Did she have a lover? Did she have children? Had she lost her parents? Why is she leaving Canada to go back to Africa in 1792? What does her life look like? Who is this woman? I just started imagining and dreaming about a, a woman and what she was like as a girl and where she came from. And I think that one of the most important decisions that a novelist makes is who will be your protagonist? And one of the 
most important factors in deciding your protagonist, I think, is to choose a person who has the most to lose. And one of the most interesting things to have in a protagonist is a person who has a risk of losing a great deal. And I thought, who else, who could lose more? Who has more to lose than a, a woman who's a midwife who uh, catches, I, I use the word loosely, who catches or delivers the babies of other women for her money, for her living, but also will lose her own children as a result of slavery. So I felt that a woman had the most to lose in my story, so it should be a woman who told it. And also, there are more slave narratives from the perspective of men than there are from women, and I thought it would be good to write a slave narrative from the perspective of a woman, even though this is a fictitious slave narrative. And it's a story that I felt. It's a story that moved me, so I just went with my creative instincts. It was a woman I, I felt like writing about. She was going to be a midwife. She was going to catch or deliver other people's babies, and men weren't doing that in the 18th century. That would happen later, and so a woman it had to be. Thank you. Thank you. There are, by the way, some great uh, narratives some great slave narratives written by women that you could find. I mentioned some of them in the back of the book. Mary Prince is one of them, and they're very, very interesting slave narratives written by women, so you might find them in your library, or um, you'll see them referenced in the back of the book. Yeah, Mary Prince's uh, narrative, I think, that was introduced by Susanna Moody, actually, yes. another Canadian settler, right, from Britain. Um, Okay, uh, more questions, please? Um, hi. Hello. <laughs> while, while I was reading the book, I realized that there was a lot of research underneath, and I wanted to ask how many time, how, how long did it take you to do all the research and then write the book? How long did it take me to research and write the book? It took five years, the whole process was five years, but I researched while I wrote. And research is a dangerous thing because it's a good way to do nothing. Uh, you could spend your life researching and never get any work done. I say that playfully. It's not true that you're doing nothing when you research. Of course you're doing something. But I say that it's a good way to do nothing because as a novelist, one of my greatest fears is disappearing into a library and never coming out <laughs> or being discovered 40 years later with a beard down to my knees because I never got out from the stacks. I got stuck in the stacks researching and never finished my work. And so because I fear that I'll spend my years researching and not writing, I have to make a deal with myself, a, a contract, a moral contract with myself and the moral contract is that I have to write from the first day of working on the novel. I can't just research or I'll never get it done. So I start writing and researching together and uh, the research unfolds as the writing does. But the whole thing took five years and I researched from the very first day to the very last. Thank you. Thank you. Who else would like to ask a question? Yes. Christian. Thank you. Um, good evening. My name is Christian. And Hello. I would like to ask you a couple of questions or a comment because, as Professor Freile said, we work with she works with a list of books, and one of them is this, the Book of Negroes, which I am very happy to have worked on because. I didn't know not, I didn't know nothing about the book, but I read the title and I thought this must be good for me. So <laughs> it was really the first time that I have the opportunity to read something that really identify myself and that I could feel in, inside. So in fact, I did this presentation with other mates and. I also wrote papers for other other courses. I wrote from my final degree paper, so I use it a lot. I'd like and to read that. <laughs> okay. Any time you want. <laughs> so Thank you. I don't have the book for you to sign it because I read it on the internet, but it was legal. Don't worry. It was, I paid. I paid for that. <laughs> so. I would like to ask, um, how did you decide to write a book like this, a story like this, like 
what was the moment when you said, I'm going to write a book on this topic and about these characters and these stories? How did I decide to write it and what was the moment? It was a very hard book to write. First of all, because it's very painful, so it was emotionally very difficult to write. And second of all, because it's hard, you don't want to brutalize your reader. You don't want to confront your reader with so much violence that they stop reading. So how to get just the right amount of brutality and just the right amount of, of, of violence that, that represents in an authentic way this kind of life my protagonist might have had without overwhelming or assaulting the reader. Um, so a novel isn't truly life, it's a representation of life. And I was thinking about it before I wrote my first book. Uh, this was my seventh book. I've now written 10, but I started thinking about it before I wrote my first book. And I sat on the story for about 15 years and let, let it grow inside me. For one, I didn't feel ready yet to write in the voice of a woman. I, d I felt not ready when I first started writing novels. I needed to wait until I was a better writer. And also, I. Um, it was such a complicated novel. It takes place in about five places. It felt like five novels in one because there's pages in Africa and then there's chapters in South Carolina and chapters in rural and urban South Carolina, chapters in New York City, in Nova Scotia, in London. It felt like writing five novels and it just needed some maturity. So I sat on the story for about 15 years and wrote six other books first until I felt ready to kind of embrace the voice of a woman and write in the voice of a girl and a woman. Uh, maybe it helped to be a father and to have four girls, you know, and a son, and that has helped, I think. Um, so I first came across the story when I borrowed a book from my parents' bookshelves. My father was an African-American who came to Canada with my mother. They fled the United States a year, at the day after they married, it was, it was impossible to be married interracially as a black man and a white woman in the United States when they married. So they came to Canada to live more freely and had their family there in Toronto where I grew up. And so my parents were scholars and they wrote a lot about black history and they had many books about black history. So one day I just stole this book from their bookshelf when, and I took it with me traveling and it was a fascinating story about the story of the black loyalist, about the creation of the Book of Negroes, about the movement of black people leaving Canada and going back to Africa. And the story was a story that was unknown to me and, um, and unknown to almost all Canadians and Americans, the story of, of these people moving back to Africa after being enslaved in the Americas and Canada. And it was so unusual that I couldn't believe my good luck that nobody had written a novel on this subject and nobody had thought to dramatize this story, so I became the first, and so I sat with it for about 15 years and wrote six other books first, and then I finally turned to it. Uh, so it was with me for a long time before I started writing it. And another question. I would like to know your perspective of slavery and racism in, the, in, in our current days, and what do you think about this is a past times issue, or is it is still overshadowing our daily basis life? And because, for example, my part of the presentation, I was comparing this to my life nowadays, and how I see that slavery is still some way or another present, and we are still suffering from differences and prejudices and all these things. And Yes, it's a, thank you for your question. And it's a, I think it's a very germane and topical question. What do I think about slavery today? Because sadly, although the transatlantic slave trade ended in the 19th century, slavery continues to this day. And there are major, well-respected organizations. One of them is called Free the Slaves. I think that one's based in London. Others based in the United States and in Canada that uh, oppose contemporary slavery and experts in North America estimate that as many as 30 million people, mostly women and children and girls, are kept in states of slavery today. Um, mostly it's sexual slavery. I'm not referring to, the, to optional prostitution. I'm referring to women and girls who are forced um, 
physically into slate states that can only be described as slavery today. 30 million people exist like this today, not to mention the millions of refugees that are on the move around the world and are suffering profoundly, about whom I've written a new book about which I'll speak tomorrow. So uh, sadly, it's an issue that has, that has uh, morphed into a new state. And although the transatlantic slave trade is over, millions of people continue to be treated in the most horrific ways imaginable today. So I think the ultimate response is that every generation, unfortunately, will have to confront injustice in its own time. And sure, we don't look at the transatlantic slavery today, but we look at issues of injustice all around the world today, and we continue to have to confront them. Just yesterday, walking around Salamanca with my daughter, Carolyn, who's here, we, I saw a demonstration in favor of refugees uh, just yesterday, just a few hundred meters from where we're sitting right now. And um, so I know it's an issue that Spaniards are concerned about as well. Uh, and uh, as are Canadians. And so I guess the short answer to your question is that we will have to confront injustice always in our own times, and so will our grandchildren. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Yeah, I think that was a very important reflection um, to link a book that is based on history, uh, past times, and link it to the present day. Any other question? I will, I'll just add quickly that some, some African Canadians and African Americans are angry to see books about slavery because they sort of say, enough. We don't need to read about this. We don't want to hear about this enough. But I don't agree with that. Do you say we won't write about the Holocaust anymore? Or do you say we won't write about the Spanish Inquisition anymore? Or do we say we won't write about war or love or hate anymore? I mean, every generation goes back to the major issues that preoccupied it. We all need to come to terms with the grand issues of our time. And why shouldn't we still be writing about or dramatizing in new ways, with new voices, in new perspectives, injustice, whether it was uh, hundreds of years ago or whether it's tomorrow. So I see absolutely no reason why artists would not continue to explore in their own ways, today and tomorrow, things that other artists have been exploring for hundreds of years. That's what we do. Actually, I think that your novel has a very important didactic um, element there. And I wonder whether that was a problem for you to try to, um, let's say, combine uh, aesthetic uh, interests and uh, a pedagogical approach so that people learn about slavery uh, people learn about the fact that Canada was not, not that uh, uh, new Canaan, that uh, paradise, that promised land for African Americans, etc. Was it uh, um, problematic for you to try to write a novel and not a treatise? <laughs> well, yes, because you know, if you read a novel, you don't want to be feeling that you're in a classroom being taught, or you don't want to feel that you're being preached to in a church. You don't want to be told how to think morally. It's insulting for a reader to be told how to think in a novel. And so you have to be very careful to let the story, as much as possible, to let the story speak for itself and not to preach at the reader or to take a position that's so openly moral that it becomes condescending to the reader. So yes, it's very tricky to find the right line to sort of create a story that's big enough to excite your reader and to introduce your reader to worlds that they might not know about without condescending to the reader. So it's always a question of balance, but I think the drama has to be the most important thing to keep your eye on, and you have to keep your eye on movement and on plot and on character development and not to stop everything by lecturing the reader on page 31. Any further question? Or uh, Yes, over there. Hello, thank you so much for coming. And um, I would like to ask you uh, the reason why you were not allowed to give uh, this title to your book in America, and you chose the title Somebody Knows My Name instead. Thank you. The question is why was I not allowed to use this title in the United States, and, and why did I use another title in the United States, which is Someone Knows 
my name. Well, I've already explained the origin for the title. I chose it because I wanted to, the title, the original title of the Book of Negroes, I wanted to, one, celebrate a forgotten document, this British naval ledger called the Book of Negroes. Also, I love the sound of it. It sounded a bit biblical. It sounded a little bit like the Book of Exodus. Uh, when I wrote, when I, the Book of Negroes, to me, it has a biblical ring to it. In book is a beautiful word in, in English, and it can have many different meanings. It can mean a book like a story, it can mean a book like a ledger, it can mean different things. It can be an accounting book, a creative book. Um, it's a beautiful word and it has a biblical resonance in English. And so I really loved the idea of resurrecting a forgotten element of black history, especially black history in Canada. Um, however, uh, my, when you publish a book, you sell your rights individually to different countries. So you sell your rights in Canada to a Canadian publisher and your rights in France to a French publisher and in America to an American publisher. So my American publisher, which is W.W. W. Norton, you may have seen some of the Norton anthologies over the years, but they also publish novels. And they've been a very good publisher for me. And they promised to publish the book as the Book of Negroes. And they released a catalog about six or eight months before it was published, and the catalog showed the book with the title, The Book of Negroes. But when a publisher in a major country like the States is releasing a book, just before they publish it, physically publish it, they start taking orders from bookstores. They start asking bookstores, how many copies will you order? How many copies will you order? And all of the Amer major American bookstore chains refuse to buy the book to make orders with the title, with the word Negroes in the title, because Negroes today has a very pejorative, a very negative connotation, although it did not have one in this novel, it does have one in the ear of African Americans today. So publishers in the States refused to order the book, and the publisher became frightened about this, and at the last minute, while I was on book tour in Germany, they sent me an email saying, we're publishing on Monday, Today's Friday, and by the way, we decided to change the name, and it's going to be something else, which I didn't like the title they were proposing. So I had to negotiate a compromise, and the compromise was that I would come up with my other title for the American market. So I called it Someone Knows My Name because it refers to the loss of naming in African culture. If you're an African and you have an African name and you're enslaved in the Americas, you're not allowed to use your name. Your name will be forgotten. Uh, yet, Aminata meets this boy that she falls in love with, um, and, and she says his name on the vessel, on the slave ship, and he's very gratified that someone says his name, someone knows my name, someone recognizes my humanity by saying my name. And so this is a line, a phrase in the book, someone knows my name. So I took it from the book to use it as a title in the American market. However, when the television miniseries came out in the United States, it was called the Book of Negroes, and nobody was upset. And so then the American publisher agreed to finally re-release the novel as the Book of Negroes. So finally, as a result of the American television industry, the novel has been republished in the United States as the Book of Negroes. So we've come full circle. Okay, thank you thank very Thank you. Much. Uh, maybe just one last remark I'd like to, to make, or question, rather. Um, uh, your novel, The Book of Negroes, has just been released in Spanish, um, and it has been translated by the renowned Mexican poet, Pura Lopez Colomé. So I'd like to know your position towards translation. Your books in translation are regarded by you as somehow co-authored books, or do you still feel they are your books? Uh, what is your feeling towards? Well, my first feeling is one of great pride and delight. Uh, nothing could be a greater honor than to have another artist, translators are artists, to have another artist in another country in another language take your work and work with it and introduce it to people in those countries. And readers in Japan or in Israel or in Turkey, they wouldn't be reading me in English. And if it weren't for translations, my works wouldn't be read in those countries, so I'm very grateful for the work of translators, especially when they're wonderful translators. Some of them become great friends, and uh, I regard a translation as a gift. It's a gift to me, it's a gift to the reader in the country that the book is being published in in another language, and 
Of course it's my book, but it's also a book by the translator. It's a, it's a, it's a co-production. I think it's important to set your ego aside and not to be too concerned with me all the time and to recognize the work of another person and it's a, it's no longer your baby it's a baby that belongs to two people at least and of course to the readers and so it's a great honor to have an artist whether it's a filmmaker or a translator take your work and move it in uh, into another medium so my overall response is one of, of tremendous pleasure and some of the translators dutch uh, french spanish you know, have become great friends of mine, and that's another beautiful thing to meet uh, electronically and then in person in their own countries or in mine. Some of these translators and to become friends with them, and some of them have translated several of my books, so I get to know them even better when they've translated three or four. Okay. Thank you. Well, it has been a great honor actually having you here today, and uh, we are also happy that we are having you again tomorrow, <laughs> so we can continue this conversation. It's getting a little bit late and especially if we want to leave some minutes aside for you to approach uh, the stage and uh, those of you who want your book signed by the author uh, you'll have a chance right now okay so thank you very much Larry and uh, thank you muchas gracias <laughs> <laughs>